It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 323 of Science on Top. Today is Monday the 18th of February 2019. I'm Ed Brown and with me today is Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. And medical entomologist from the University of Sydney in New South Wales Health Pathology, Dr Cameron Webb. Welcome back. Yeah, hello. Pleasure to be here. It's uh, really exciting to have you on because there's been a number of insect stories uh, just in the last couple of weeks that I uh, really want to dive into. But uh, before we start, I just want to point out to everyone that this is part six of our 10-week campaign supporting the Fred Hollows Foundation and Doctors Without Borders. This is in memory of a good friend of ours and a listener, Penelope Green, who passed away late last year. And we're donating all of the Patreon contributions we get for 10 weeks to those charities to honour her. If you want to be a part of that, just head to scienceontop.com slash donate. So Cameron, like I said, there have been a lot of stories in the news uh, the last few weeks about insects. Uh, perhaps the biggest one that got the most attention came from a review study published in the journal Biological Conservation that found that over 40% of insect species are threatened with extinction. Now, we tend to think that insects are everywhere and they've even been touted as an underappreciated food source. So what's killing all the insects? Yeah, it's a really interesting kind of review, although it's sort of when you, when you think about comparing sort of the global decline of, of any animals, it's still a relatively small amount of, of reports and papers to be relying on. And, and one of the problems here, the, the general consensus is, is that th there have been these anecdotal reports of, of insect declines all around the world. And, you know, the classic story that people talk about are uh, the windshield studies where, um, you know, scientists and ecologists and general public have these memories of driving through the countries or towns or maybe even close to the cities and every summer having to s spend time scraping insects and things off the windshield of their cars or off the headlights and things like that. And I, I remember that as well. Um, but people seem to be scraping fewer and fewer insects off their windshield. Um, and so that's kind of added to these anecdotal stories too about, you know, people not remembering as many butterflies or as many moths or as many Christmas beetles when we get into summer. And so people have been starting to say, well, well what's going on? Are, are insects really declining or, or does everybody have sort of short memories or, or, or there's some other issue that's, mm -hmm. you know, corrupting, I guess, these sort of uh, anecdotal reports. But there are some studies around the world that are showing that insects are declining, but it's particular, type, particular types of insects. And so while our urban pests, you know, things like cockroaches and some ants and, and mosquitoes particularly, seem to be doing quite well, there are other insects that are under threat. And that's no surprise when you think that there are insects associated, closely associated with habitats that are really threatened by both urbanization, um, pollution, things like climate change, sort of heat waves, sea level rise. And it's no surprise that insects are, that are found in those really vulnerable habitats are under threat. And I think that's one of the key elements that came out of this recent review was that if you're an insect that has a very specialized ecological niche, and that niche is going to be one of the most vulnerable uh, that's going to be impacted either by human activity or climate change, uh, the future is not looking so great for you. So I guess the question for you then, Cameron, the, the relevant one then is mosquitoes, which is your area of specialty. Are they in threat? Are we going to not have to worry about malaria and Ross River and things like that now? Or is that not the case? Yeah, it's a really great question to think about. And and there's probably some mosquitoes that are doing better now than they ever done, have done before. Um, you know, some mosquitoes are... Because mosquitoes are some of the most adaptable animals on the planet, and there's a range of mosquitoes that live quite happily and actually thriving in close proximity to people. And so a mosquito like the yellow fever mosquito, Aedes aegypti, it's given up its habitat that used to be in tree, water-filled tree holes and the water-filled axles of plants, and now it lives in drains and buckets and takeaway food containers in our cities. And, and it seems to be thriving. It drives these outbreaks of dengue we see in many parts of the world. It was responsible 
for the outbreak of Zika virus in Brazil. And generally speaking, it's doing well. It's even beating some of the ways in which we're trying to kill it. So while the widespread use of insecticides is identified as one of the factors that's leading to the decline of these other insects. In actual fact, for the yellow fever mosquito, it's starting to become resistant to these commonly used insecticides. And so even though we're trying to kill it, it's, it's actually doing quite well. But then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got these mosquitoes that are either incredibly rare or like other insects are found in very specialized ecological niches. And these might be mosquitoes that we don't kind of really care about from a public health point of view. So even in Australia, we've got a group of mosquitoes uh, that belong to the genus Uranitania, uh, and they feed almost exclusively on frogs. And so you wonder if you know we're damaging the environment and causing the decline in some frog populations. Does that mean there's going to be a knock-on effect by some of the on some of these mosquitoes that feed on frogs, or if there are mosquitoes found in uh, some remote rainforest type environment? You know, again, close association with some type of plant or a or a wetland that's under threat. Well, then, sure, those mosquitoes are probably going to be under threat as well. So, the problem is is that the mosquitoes that are probably under threat we don't care about or we don't know about. The mosquitoes that are a major concern uh, seem to be doing a pretty good job and they're pretty resilient to our efforts to intentionally kill them. They're probably going to survive these unintended um, consequences of climate change or urbanisation. Just to clarify, when you say that there's that species of mosquitoes that feeds on frogs, tell me you mean the blood of the frogs, not actually <laughs> eating the frogs. Oh, my God, that's horrific. <laughs> How big are these mosquitoes? I would... I, I would no, no. You're, you're asking the wrong question. How small are these frogs? Yeah. <laughs> There's some very small frogs in Australia. No, um, yeah, they're, they're definitely they they bite um, they bite frogs more so than than other sort of uh, warm blooded animals. So so it, it, we think about mosquitoes as primarily biting people, or at least most people do. But you know, even in Australia, of the 300 or so mozzies that we've got. The vast majority of them will will feed on some sort of warm-blooded animal. It'll usually be a bird, some kind of mammal or, or us. But there are other mosquitoes that are pretty specific to feeding on these sort of cold-blooded animals. There's, you know, reports of, of mosquitoes feeding on, um, you know, not just frogs, but also kind of reptiles like snakes, um, even mudskippers sometimes. Um, and then there's a, a, a suite of mosquitoes that, or a couple of mosquitoes anyway, that don't feed on blood at all. And, and they get their energy from, um, you know, the, the nutrition they um, accumulate when they're uh, larvae in the aquatic phase. Um, so, yeah, so there are some of these close associations that some mosquitoes have with particular types of um, animals or environments. And so, um, yeah, again, I guess this is the thing about mosquitoes is that they are as intrinsically linked to their environment as any other insect. And, you know, when we think of in insects as sort of bioindicators of the health of the environment, mosquitoes are really no different. And there's probably some of these species that, you know, again, associated with these um, more fragile ecological niches that are under a threat. But then at the same time, some of the work that we've done, particularly in urban wetlands, we've found that mosquitoes, like abundant mosquito populations, can be a symptom of the poor health of the environment. And so if you have a degraded area of mangrove forest, for instance, it's probably more likely to be producing more mosquitoes than uh, a healthy environment. What are the main predators for mosquitoes? Do they have any natural predators? Because we often talk about insects being the bottom of the food chain sort of thing that uh, gives sustenance to bats and birds and that sort of stuff. I assume mosquitoes have their own prey as well? Yeah, they certainly do. And it, and it varies sort of depending on the type of environment. So everything from you know birds and bats and fish and frogs um, can all prey on on mosquitoes whether they're adults or, or larvae there was a paper I saw recently that talked about ants foraging on mosquito eggs that are laid within uh, water holding containers um, you know lots of birds lots of birds feed on mosquitoes and that's one of the reasons why in recent years when people have investigated some of the broad-scale mosquito control programs, particularly some studies out of Europe, the, the suggestion has been that, that maybe doing mosquito control, even though the products we use these days are pretty safe, they don't have a lot of non-target impacts, they're not knocking off a lot of the other insects in the ecosystem, you know, what happens by just simply doing mosquito control? Because mosquitoes are a really abundant food source. Each mosquito isn't very nu nutritious. It's a 
about as nutritious as a fingernail. So, um, that, but it's the sheer volume of them that might be an important um, food source. The, the jury's still out, though, on whether you know reducing mosquito populations really has a knock-on effect to the broader ecosystem because we just don't know enough about sometimes the prey of these other other animals. Um, so a great example of this is um, I had a PhD student I was working with um, called Leroy Gonsalves, who's a really great bat researcher. And he and I did some work where we looked at the role of mosquitoes found in our coastal wetlands on the diet of these small insectivorous bats. And so these are tiny little bats that'll sit in the palm of your hand and they predominantly eat insects. And what we found is that even though the bats were sort of changing their activity based on the abundance and the distribution of mosquitoes between wetlands and forest type environments, when we collected the bats and looked at their poo, uh, we found that um, they were all the bats, all the bats we looked at, all the individual specimens were eating moths. But only a, only about half of the very smallest bats were looking were eating mosquitoes, and so uh, it was a really great study. We were looking at the DNA of moths and mosquitoes in in bat poo, but what, what that kind of really confirmed to us is that mosquitoes are more of a snack food than a staple in the diet of these bats. And I suspect that's the case for a lot of wildlife. But it might be that mosquitoes, even though they're a snack food, they might be really important at certain parts of an animal's life cycle. So, you know, if it's just had young or it's just about to migrate, you know, maybe it can fatten itself up just by the sheer volume of mosquitoes it eats, even though it would rather eat a beetle or a moth. Um, it has a bit more nutrients in it. Hmm. And so with these this declining uh, population of insects, do we, know, do we have a rough idea of what the main causes are? Is it just... Uh, human spreading and uh, climate change, or is it a whole host of things? I yeah, imagine? I think it's. I think it's. You're right. It's a whole host of things. I mean, there's no doubt that um, you know a changing climate is going to impact insects in many different ways. I mean, the you know even though insects love warm weather, uh, they're just as likely to be impacted by these really hot dry summers. You can imagine there's a lot of insects that have been decimated by uh, flooding events that have happened in North Queensland recently. Um, the biggest problem, though, is I guess we're physically removing environments that these insects rely on. So you, you think of uh, large open areas of native grassland that that don't exist because they're now buried under suburban development, um, or there are creek lines that are heavily polluted and don't provide adequate um, habitat for these aquatic in, that, for insects that require an aquatic phase, or maybe their aquatic phase is incredibly sensitive to pollution. And so they really can't survive in some of these urban waterways that we're polluting with, you know, with with chemicals and things like that that are, are, are reducing the quality of the water. The other thing too is that, particularly since the fifties, I suppose there's been pretty widespread use of insecticide, not just in the agricultural industry, but particularly in our own homes. Uh, and and so the ways in which you go about doing mosquito, you know, pest control around your home can be really knocking off some of these other insects. And so. You know, there's a pay, uh, an article we just, um, you know, together with some some colleagues, we wrote a, an article recently about trying to bring the idea of integrated pest management into our cities. And so integrated pest management means you're trying to control pests by using a range of different methods. And it's really been championed in agriculture, particularly organic uh, farming, where you don't rely on insecticides. You think about ways in which you can modify the environment, maybe encourage those pre those predators or parasites of the um, the insect pests. Um, and the same can be done in our homes. Like we're probably way too quick to, to grab the insect sprays to get rid of spiders that we don't need to, get rid of insects in our backyards that we don't really need to. But we've, you know, unfortunately, some of us have a pretty low tolerance for insects in our backyard and around our home. And, and maybe we need to kind of, uh, you know, lessen that a little bit because there's collateral damage when we're using these um, these insecticides. And, um, you know, so, so unfortunately, whether it be pollution or the pesticides we're using, people uh, as well as climate change are, are impacting all of these insects. I think actually the study even found that uh, the steepest declines in insect populations happened in areas of farmland that were treated with the neonicotinoid insecticides, uh, which we've have seen it being linked to the bee deaths and things as well. So yeah, that's that's right. And I think thinking about you know that's a, a fairly um, you know potent uh, insecticide, and and I'm not surprised at all that it's having those sort of non-target impacts. But one of the problems is that we're we're sort of forced into this situation in some respects because we've been so 
um, you know, we've seen so kind of enthusiastic about using some of the uh, pyrethroid insecticides that you know some of our agricultural pests are becoming resistant to it, and we know this is exactly the same with mosquitoes. Some of the mosquitoes that are our, our worst public health concerns are becoming resistant to these commonly used insecticides. And so um, we have to look at to al- alternatives. And it's the same scenario that we're dealing with, um, you know, antibiotic-resistant bacteria in, in our healthcare system. It's the same with pests in our environment. And, and that's driving, um, you know, some of the innovation for some of these new techniques to try to control mosquitoes, um, some of the things like genetic modification, but also forcing people to try some of these other insecticides and unfortunately uh, it always holds the potential there that there's collateral damage when we try to use them in a in a very kind of you know uh, you know very, very widespread way it's also it seems like quite a sad irony or almost a tragedy that um, other solutions such as uh, genetically modified crops for example that might be more resilient to certain uh, you know insect uh, infestations are uh, have a pretty bad rap you know there's there's large sections of the western world that are that are that are you know quite anti gm crops um, when you compare it to the i guess very blunt weapon that is insecticides you know it might might mean a, a much more targeted approach rather than sort of let's just take out everything with with more than two legs um that's this in the area yeah that's right and i think a really great example of that um there's the scientists from from the uk that have been trialing the release of genetically modified mosquitoes and and in short what they do is they they're, they're releasing male mosquitoes that have been modified so that then when they mate with the wild females the offspring aren't viable. So you're basically using mosquitoes against mosquitoes as a control agent, as an mm. insecticide. Now, there's been a lot of resistance in some communities, particularly around Florida, where scientists have been looking to trial this. And it, it's often cited that, you know, this is kind of a, um, there's, there's environmental risks to releasing these mosquitoes. And, you know, some of those concerns might be valid. It only but goes one generation deep. Like it, it stops itself, does it not? Well, Unless they keep reintroducing them. Yeah, and the, and the, and if everything works as they expect, that's the case. And so as a consequence, you could argue that the release of genetically modified mosquitoes is actually one of the most ecologically sustainable ways to control mosquitoes because at the moment, you know, we saw through the outbreak or the transmission of Zika virus in Florida and we see it whenever there's local transmission of dengue virus, you know, there's aerial applications of broad-scale ins- insecticides that are not specific to mosquitoes and will be killing everything else. And and if I sometimes think these communities, if they had a better understanding about, um, you know, the consequences to these different types of you know, mosquito control, they'd kind of get a better appreciation that, you know, some of these emerging technologies can actually offer much more ecologically sustainable ways forward to, to reduce the risks of mosquito-borne disease. Your last comment covers so many of the subjects we discuss on this show, <laughs> everything from vaccinations to, you know, all of these topics, that if only people understood it a little bit better. Yeah, I think you've got to, uh, you know, I, I think working in my field where I, I do overlap with a lot of people who are in public health and, and particularly in relation to sort of uh, vaccinations and understanding why people don't, um, you know, don't like vaccines or don't uptake um, uh, vaccinations. And I think it's really important to understand why people don't do that. And I think that uh, in relation to mosquito control, for one example, I think we're getting better at understanding community attitudes to these things, but I don't think we've been so great in the past. And this is kind of one of the things that I, I really advocate quite strongly is that when we talk about um, you know integrated pest management it's it's one of the first thing one of the first priorities really needs to be community education and engagement you know understanding mm. you know why do people want to reach for the insecticides at first go or, or why don't people want to remove water filled containers from their backyards because they that provide a, a, a home for mosquitoes and i think that can be that's probably one of the key ingredients here in trying to make a breakthrough and shifting the ways that we we do pest control is is understanding how how these communities and these cultures um you know differ in their attitudes and and trying to find a way through to be sort of have empathy for why they might be scared about spiders and wanting to do control but how do we um convince them that they don't need to spray insecticide um to do it you're right a flamethrower is a far more effective solution (laughs) than spiders (laughs) So I'm sure that if flamethrowers are available readily from the local hardware store, maybe more people would do it. Thank goodness they don't. 
I, I, yeah. I truly believe I'm doing my bit because I've, 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 I've managed to, to change myself from severely, severely arachnophobic uh, to I, I can handle it if they're in the room with me. I can pretty much handle it if they're anywhere other than immediately above me on the ceiling that, you know, <laughs> I have issues with that. I live in a rainforest, so we get a lot of spiders here, a lot of white tails, a lot of um, uh, huntsmen's here. And I've, I've come to sort of think of them now as, as my little helper bots that go out, you know, <laughs> that go out and, and seek out and destroy uh, other things that, that we don't want around. So I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm not, not, <laughs> not going to the flamethrower option. But on that note, Cameron, then when we next have a barbecue and there's mosquitoes around, should, should we, obviously we're not going to spray insecticide around them, but are our repellents still effective? Is it, is DDT, I think, still the, the best option? Yeah, or? so there's, you raise a good point there. So, so DDT, obviously, that's an insecticide. So, um, and obviously has a lot of wraps about it from its, uh, it, it is not the great thing to be spraying around the backyard. Um, but, uh, What's commonly referred to as DEET, so uh, a chemical called uh, that's yeah. So, so but but that's a good point to raise because p- there is a bit of confusion about that, which leads some people to be overly concerned about using um, DEET as a repellent because they sort of get a bit mixed up. They sort of associate it with um, DDT and the bad wraps are associated with that chemical. But when it comes to repellents, the the topical insect repellents that we use um, when we're outside of the barbecue. They are great because they switch off the blood feeding behavior of mosquitoes, um, but they're not killing them. And so it means right. that they mm-hmm. can they can help reduce that nuisance biting. They can help reduce the chances that we're going to get a mosquito borne disease, but they don't impact the insects themselves. With you know, with the exception that the insects don't get to a blood meal from you, um, but they probably <laughs> they starve they, to death. <laughs> I, can, I can tell you that probably your pets, your neighbours, or or, or or something else is probably getting bitten instead of you. But but that's um you know that's again I mean it's a good way to kind of go about trying to prevent those bites in the backyard because there are people who um, will use a lot of insecticides in the backyard, and I know that there are plenty of commercial systems that can be in place where you're spraying. Uh, the vegetation or the side of your home with a, what we call a residual um, insecticide that's a, similar to the type of products you'd use on the floor of your kitchen to kill cockroaches and things like that. They, once you start spraying that around plants and the side of buildings, um, all of those uns- other insects that are sort of seeking refuge in your plants or crawling around your walls are going to be exposed to it and die. So, um, yeah, maybe passing around a, a couple of uh, a tubes of insect repellent is a good way to stop the mozzie bites and protecting your um, your, your backyard wildlife as well. I've got another uh, method, Ed, that you can use if you like. <laughs> you specifically, because uh, um, you know my wife. If she's sitting at the same table, she'll attract all of them. You don't have to worry. So uh, that's is that a thing, Cameron? A, a certain you know you know chemical makeups, hormones, blood types. Is there something? Why do some people become such mozzy attractants? Yeah, it's great. It's a great question. Um, we know it happens, uh, and we know time and time again that um, you know there's a lot of variation in how many mosquitoes we might attract or how attractive mosquitoes might find us. Um, I know it myself because sometimes I have to reject people from studies because they're not bitten by enough mosquitoes. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> that sounds like one of them good problems to have. <laughs> sometimes it's not. Um, but but I, look, mosquitoes find us through a, a variety of kind of. Yeah, sort of cues, if you like. And so so it's a female mosquito that bites and she needs that blood to develop her eggs. And so um, she she can get it from a whole range of kind of blood sources. But if we take the mosquito that, that bites people, for instance, um, they can sense the carbon dioxide we breathe out and that makes sense. It's one of the common denominators for all these warm-blooded animals. Then when they get, get closer to us, um, it's probably the smell of our skin that makes a difference. And so there's supposedly three, 400 chemical compounds on our skin. We sweat them out. The bacteria on our skin uh, sort of emit these odors. And this cocktail of smells are either attracted to, attractive to some mosquitoes or less attractive when it comes to other, other people. And that's probably what the mosquitoes are honing in on. So even though they are after blood, it's not the blood itself that's really prompting them to feed on us. It's this this chemistry on our smell of our skin. 
there's some studies that have been done in Africa where they're really interested in um, malaria transmission, particularly um, uh, pregnant women and things like that, that who are a really high risk group of being in- infected. Some of those studies have suggested that those mosquitoes like to feed on or have a, a slight preference for people who have type O blood, but that doesn't mean the mozzie that's biting you um, you know, when you're holidaying on the north coast of New South Wales is similarly responding to that. And we've one of the great studies that has sort of demonstrated this is um, some scientists in Europe uh, decided to look at a, a whole range of different uh, lures for mosquitoes. What could they, what sort of smells could they get to attract mosquitoes? Because if you can uh, if you can create a lure for a mosquito trap that a trap that's more attractive than uh, a warm blooded person, that's great because you just switch the trap on in the backyard and you don't have to worry about putting on this you know sticky repellent every every year. And one of the products they came up with was uh, Limburger cheese, and and so that might that <laughs> might sound wow. like a, a really weird choice, and until you. Th- you know, Limburger cheese is one of supposedly one of the most sort of pungent smelling cheeses available. And one of the things that gives the cheese this pungent smell is a bacteria in it, which is very closely related to the bacteria you find between the toes of your feet. And huh. and some mosquitoes find this incredibly attractive. And it's un, it's unsurprising that this mosquito also generally we notice that sort of bites down around the ankles and lower feet. But if you expose that cheese to other types of mosquitoes, they don't respond. And so this is one of our, our problems or one of our challenges when we, it, it's almost impossible to build a mosquito trap that will catch everything because mosquitoes are these diverse animals. They have different hosts, the different preferences for feeding and habitats and, and things like that. Look, an, Another great example to highlight this is the mosquitoes that, come into your bedroom at night and buzz around your ear and sometimes they're oh my they're, god i hate them so much and, and that, <laughs> yeah that noise <laughs> and, and this is kind of you know for, for a lot of people this is actually a more annoying thing uh, rather than the mosquito bites themselves and and so people will often ask me you know why is it this mosquito makes this particular kind of whiny sound but the thing is, is that, that the sound of that mosquito, that's the sound of the wing beats that you can hear, is actually not that di- much different to any other mosquito. But the mosquito that's coming in and buzzing around your ear is most likely to be a, a species called the brown house mosquito called Culex quinquefasciatus. And, and it prefers to bite birds more than mammals. And so you know, my, prop- my theory is that the, the, the mosquito comes in, it's flying around your head, mostly because your head is the part that's exposed above the sheets and things like that. It's, it's sensing the carbon dioxide, but it's trying to work out whether you're a large featherless bird and whether it really wants to bite you or not. Um, and it's that indecisiveness that kind of really means you can hear it. If it's one of these mosquitoes, like the yellow fever mosquito that that likes to bite people, it'll be in, take a parcel of blood and be left before you even have, have had a chance to hear it. A ninja. Yeah, very much so. And wasn't there, wasn't there something about alcohol or beer that that, that attracts them? Yeah, yeah, it certainly does. So so generally speaking, um, there's no scientific evidence that anything that you eat or drink can completely stop mosquitoes biting you. But your diet might subtly change the the amount of mosquitoes you get. But at the end of the day, if you want to prevent mosquito-borne disease, you want to stop all mosquito bites, not just get a few less mosquito bites. But there was a study in, in Africa that looked at whether or not people consuming beer were more attractive to mosquitoes. And so they, they took a, a group of people, put them in a tent, gave them beer. Uh, another group of people put them in a tent, gave them water. Um, and then they released these mosquitoes down a, a Y-shaped tube and, you know, statistically more but not dramatically more mosquitoes flew towards the beer drinkers now why that why that is i guess there's a couple of theories maybe drinking beer you have a slightly higher body temperature Um, maybe the beer changed the way your skin smelled or there was another kind of odor in your breath or something like that but at the end of the day um again it's one of these studies it's really neat study uh, our journalists love to talk to me about it leading up to Australia Day usually. Um, <laughs> but it doesn't mean that avoiding alcohol is going to stop you getting bitten by mosquitoes. And and I think at the end of the day, and what I usually recommend, you know, at the Australian barbecue during summer, drinking alcohol probably will make you be bitten by more mosquitoes because the more you drink, the less likely you are to remember to put on mosquito repellent. Ah, very good. Very good point. <laughs> um. I guess one final mosquito story then uh, we should talk about is you mentioned at the start of the show the floods in North Queensland, um, which was 
insane amount of flooding. And the the difficulty then of predicting how much disease we're uh, likely to see from that influx of mosquitoes because they love water to lay their eggs. And it's not as simple as you might think, is it? No, it's it's not. And we, we're used to the almost standard warnings that will be issued by by health authorities after flooding to kind of avoid mosquitoes. And and, and that's for, for you know, pretty good reasons. Um, um, there should be no suggestion that that's incorrect. There's usually stacks of mosquitoes after flooding. You're right, mosquitoes love water. And if that water comes in floods during the warmer months of the year, uh, mosquitoes will love it and they'll have a chance to generate some pretty – uh, phenomenal population sometimes incredibly abundant the nuisance biting alone can be really problematic particularly if uh, people are displaced from their homes or homes have been damaged mm. um, you know we see that in other experiences particularly overseas where hurricanes can do damage or in far north queensland we have cyclone cyclones and there's other damage to properties the problem is uh, particularly in australia and particularly when we're talking about uh, diseases such as those caused by ross river virus which um, funnily enough runs through Townsville, um, is that just because you get more mosquitoes, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get more disease. There's a, a chance you will, but it doesn't guarantee it. And one of the reasons for that is that for an outbreak of disease to occur, it doesn't need just mosquitoes. You need the right wildlife in the local environment as well. And for something like Ross River virus, which is really Australia's homegrown mosquito-borne disease, the anim- mosquitoes don't hatch out of the wetlands infected with the virus. They have to bite animals to pick it up first. And those animals are generally kangaroos and wallabies. And so if you imagine those images we've seen of the flooding across Townsville, the whole landscape is underwater. And it's no surprise mm. that that really causes disruption to the local wildlife. We've, we've heard stories about huge amounts of stock losses in some of the agricultural lands. And there's no surprise, I think, that there would be, you know, just similar disruption and, and sort of damage to local wildlife populations. So where you have these displaced wildlife um or their populations are lower, that also contributes to an in- a decreased risk of mosquito-borne disease. Um, similarly, in the initial phases of the flooding and immediately after, there's almost too much water flying around. You know, mosquitoes love these stagnant pools that might be less than about 30 centimetres deep. These big bodies of water that are moving around you know, there's chemicals that are in the water because of the flooding of urban areas. You've got oils and other kind of substances that probably aren't great for mosquitoes. And so the mozzies really only take advantage kind of weeks or maybe even months after the initial flooding because all that water, flood water subsides, some of the uh, wildlife come back, and the mosquito populations have a chance to pick up. So while it's a, a wait and see situation to see what happens in Townsville, certainly the floods have arrived at a good time of the year. We've got, you know, a couple of months, three months you know, to go of, of warm weather up there, there's, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of mosquitoes and, and really it's just waiting and seeing and, and doing some monitoring to see whether there's going to be an elevated risk of, of Ross River virus. And I think just finally on that point, just one recent example which is worth pointing out is that, um, you know, in the lead up to Christmas in, in 2016, um, you know, Victoria suffered, um, you know, a, a horrendous kind of flooding in inland areas um, you know, in the bottom of the sort of Murray-Darling Basin sort of system. And we saw phenomenal um, mosquito populations in inland New South Wales and in Victoria. And and in the summer over that period, Victoria, um, you know, experienced its biggest outbreak of Ross River virus disease on record. So, um, a- again, a, a contributing factor to that, I have no doubt, is the fact that the flooding came in spring gave lots of time for those mosquitoes to build up their populations. And it's a different scenario in um, in Townsville, of course, but if we had a comparable flooding situation in southern parts of Australia so late in the summer, in the summer you might find that the cool weather, particularly the cool nights that arrive in autumn, might put a stop to that very quickly. And so, um, again, understanding the risks associated with these flooding events are really complex and depend on where in Australia and when in Australia, when the, the flooding occurs. Okay. So if you are in far north Queensland and you're worried about that, there's probably not a huge increase in risk. So just keep applying the DEET and the other repellents as normal. Yeah, I think so. You should be Yeah, I think that's right. I think all the normal um, measures on avoiding mosquito bites during the cleanup are are advised and 
you know, wearing repellents, long sleeve shirts and long pants if you can, um, but any of the topical insect repellents that contain things like deed, picaridin, or, or even oil or lemon eucalyptus, um, applying it all on all exposed areas of skin will provide great protection. And I, th- I think just one last point on that is too is a, just keeping an eye on the, the the local updates from you know both Queensland Health and some of the local public health units because I noticed that. Uh, there were some warnings about waterborne pathogens, and and they probably um, pose a, a greater short term risk during the cleanups for floodwater. So that's something colleagues of mine who kind of work in the the field of environmental health are always sort of reminding people about. You know, there's so much water flowing around, and the stuff that's in it, it probably poses a greater immediate risk to your health than the mozzies that are that are breeding it. Yeah, there were all sorts of soil microbacteria that, that that are now, you know, much more likely to come in contact with humans that, that, than they normally would. Um, I was reading about those the other day. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think from memory, when we had the major flooding through Brisbane, which was maybe in 2011 or, or there 2012. Um, again, a similar concerns about mosquito-borne disease were, were raised, but I, from memory, I think that um, you know, in those initial phases, these waterborne pathogens posed a, a much, you know, much greater risk of, of illness. And when people are out in the water trying to clean up, and you know, this the water and the contaminated soils and things are sort of splashing on you and things like that, it's a, you know, so, something to be be cautious of. All crocodiles. Yeah. Watch out for them. They, 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 yeah, crocodiles. There's are not been fun. some great. There's been some great uh, shots of crocodiles, isn't there, in the, in, in suburban yeah. streets and of sharks. And stuff. Sharks swimming down street, <laughs> <laughs> which of course lead to the inevitable uh, memes about the dangers of coming to Australia. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm yes. fortunate that crocodiles is not something I have to deal with um, uh, in the wetlands around Sydney. But um, but uh, yeah, maybe sometime down the track we'll have to worry about that. <laughs> Oh, well, climate change could bring crocodiles to a park near you. Yeah. So, you know, something to look forward to. <laughs> I'll stay tuned. <laughs> okay. Well, Penny, if someone were bitten by a mosquito and they got Ross River virus, their body would very likely try and put them into sleep, a special <laughs> kind of sleep to help them heal. Can you tell us about that? I can. I love your segue, Zed. <laughs> 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 this is a particularly good one. Um, yeah, so sleep is one of those things that's often studied, but I still feel that for all that it's been studied, we really have the vaguest idea of like what it's for and why we need it and why does it manifest in the way it does and not something else and what causes it and so on. So we have a lot of really good ideas about that and really plausible theories, but it's really hard to find, you know, a sleep gene or sleep genes or something. So This research is looking at a gene that can produce a substance that seems to induce sleep. So I never knew this, but apparently in the early 20th century, there was some Japanese and French research, independently done, where spinal fluids were collected from dogs who'd been deprived of sleep and then injected into active rested dogs. And then that caused the other one, the, the the new dog's, you know what I mean, the, the non-sleepy mm. dogs to then fall into sl- a really deep sleep later. And I'm guessing like sooner than they would have been predicted to otherwise. So it does seem that there is kind of some substance in the blood or substances that might induce sleep. And what's been found is a gene in, in flies that called Nemuri that seems to be involved with the kind of sleep that you might need if you're sick, like fighting off an infection. So flies, even though in some ways, you know, we're only really interested in our own sleep, not per se in the sleep of flies, they do provide a somewhat, a limited but useful model for understanding what's going on with people. And they definitely give give clues about where we might look with people. So this gene has been found um, and there was not a lot of genes that seemed to be potentially relevant to sleep. I think they tested 8,000 different genes and only found one that induced sleep. Um, And it's not also one that necessarily is involved with the sleep you get because you've been awake for a long time because flies where this gene is disabled actually don't have disrupted sleep. They still go to sleep for, so they edited flies with CRISPR to, uh-huh. you know, disable gene. If this gene is gone, flies still do go to sleep. However, even But they like, don't go into that, that deep that, sleep. 
No, they're easier to wake up, but it's not kind of, this gene isn't involved in just our ordinary sleep. But what it might be involved with is the sleep when you're sick because it's also the protein that's made is antimicrobial. So one that can help fight infection. And so it was found that like we do when we're sick, flies sleep more if they're infected. And it seems like when flies were infected, they slept for longer if this gene was switched on and shorter times if the gene was disabled. So it seems, I thought this was really interesting because I think in some ways when I think about sleep, it's just such a fundamental part of life that I don't Mm. really think, oh yeah, we do sleep more, you know, when we're sick. Mm. I just go, oh yeah, because you're tired, because you're sick. But there's all these mechanisms that are in control of that. And I thought this was really fascinating because even though this gene doesn't have an obvious human equivalent, we do produce over a hundred of those antimicrobial proteins. So similar products to the gene. And it could be that they might play a role in our sleep in triggering, mm-hmm. I don't want to say sick sleep, but you know, sleep, sleep to help you fight off an infection. Now, why sleep is useful for fighting off infections. I mean, that's also a really interesting question. But yeah, yeah. I, I thought this was interesting. So there, there's no human equivalent of that particular gene that's only found in flies Just at the moment. Just in flies. Um, there's no, well, no obvious equivalent, I mean. It, it'd be fascinating to, uh, if they were to discover a gene or a group of genes that, that acted mm. that way in humans, whether they become less active or more active as, as humans age, mm. because, you know, obviously insomnia and, and the, the overall amount of sleep that people have as they get older and older seems to decline. So that, that would be a really useful thing to, to look at because it might help point at some of the, the genes that are, that are involved as well. Just on that last point, about the, um, you know, there's no there's no human equivalent to this gene. There's, uh, I just noticed, I was, I was in reading the story as Penny was talking and, and I was thinking, <laughs> I like this story, it's well written. It's a Ned Young story. <laughs> 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 but uh, he finishes off, just, I'll just read what he wrote here. It says, 25 years ago, whilst working with the lab of Michael Young, uh, Shingle uh, helped to show that a gene called Timeless controls the daily body clocks of flies. There wasn't an obvious human equivalent of that either. Uh, but some researchers were sceptical of the discovery had any relevance, but in time, a human version was discovered and it has uh, involved in several important diseases. So, yeah, you, you don't know. Yeah, we might not know about it now, but they, they could in fact be there and you've got to start somewhere. And flies are great because they're simple or simpler. <laughs> yeah, it's good to have a direction to proceed in and it's a good clue. Uh, Penny, did you notice um, the method that in the study they used to uh to deprive the uh the flies of sleep interestingly it's almost exactly the method that has resulted from my decision to become a parent which is frequently being shaken and lots of caffeine so- <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i'm very familiar with its efficacy <laughs> <laughs> right very good. Yes. <laughs> but Penny, I think that's great. I mean, as a as a, a parent myself and uh, those fatigue, like, wouldn't it be won't it be great when we've got our um, sort of the the sleep benefit pill that we can take, and so it's going to give us that kind of surge of energy as if we've had uninterrupted eight hours of sleep. And that's kind of. Oh no no no! We're not going to take oh. it. Guess who's going to take it? <laughs> 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 Take your yeah, medicine. Yeah, the sleep that will take care of itself. Everyone takes it. <laughs> wow. Ah, oh, don't even joke. Uh, I can imagine the uh, the airlines just pumping it into the air in the plane so they don't have to serve mm. you drinks all night because everyone's asleep. <laughs> You'd really want the cockpit to un- be on a separate air supply. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> all right. Well, Lucas, the gut is often called the second brain because we're learning more and more how sophisticated it is and how much it influences our bodies and our behaviour from immune system regulation to hunger and taste and even our emotions. All these things are affected by our digestive system. And now new research published in the journal Cell shows that the bacteria in our guts can affect our moods 
and our mental health. Is that right? Yes, and th- and this idea is not new. This has actually come out of other studies over the last almost decade long uh, that you know these links have been pointed out. And there's actually a thing called the the gut brain axis, which is the system by which the gut microbiota interacts with the central nervous system. So there's a bidirectional link between the gut and the nervous system, and therefore the brain. And that link is becoming more and more obvious and and uh, more and more interactions are being observed. So I had a look at some previous studies uh, relating to this, and as I said, it goes back quite some time now. And they had, for example, uh, there was there was a group of studies that that identified that Western diets that were rich in saturated fat often uh, that, that that often resulted in obesity also resulted in depression like behavior. And one of the outcomes of that was they noted that there were particular, um, there were particular uh, microbes uh, that that were in, that were implicated. That if they fed those micro uh, bio, uh, so those microbes to um, to uh, to mice, then they could induce depressive type activity in those mice without having to feed them the high fat diet. So you know, there, there's there's a, a causative relationship potentially there, but also. The, you know the question is still out at the moment as to whether there's whether this is causation or correlation with re- relation to these particular uh, bacteria strains that they've uh, that this latest study looked at so this latest study they basically looked at some data that came from GPS there were over a thousand people that took place in this particular study which is known as the Flemish gut flora project they had a uh, thousand and fifty four participants uh, specifically and what they looked at were two bugs that uh, that were commonly found um, in in people who who had um, uh, depressive uh, uh, diagnosis, uh, which were the uh, now here, here we go. I did practice pronouncing these. There was the <laughs> Coprococcus and the Dialista um, uh, uh, bugs, and basically they seem to have a high correlation with people who are suffering depression, and that was after correcting for any confounding effects of antidepressants that people might have been taking on the gut microbiome. Um, There were a couple of other um, um, uh, microbes that were involved as well, but what it it, basically found was that it, it built upon previous studies that have shown that there appeared to be some kind of link between gut flora and depression and anxiety uh, uh, states, but they just weren't sure whether they were causative or they were just, um, you know, which direction it was basically is, the, is you know, are people who are depressed mm. more prone to building up these particular uh, bugs or are the bugs being, right. you know, persistent uh, leading to the depression. So there's obviously there's a heck of a lot more study to do with this, but it's, it's really, really interesting to me. And we have talked about microbiome qu- on quite a few shows over the years, it's really interesting to me that this link between the gut and the brain is is starting to become so important on so many different levels. Like here we're talking about microbiome, but there's also things like inflammation of the gut, which can be related to microbiome that also has relationship to potentially to uh, depression, anxiety type um, illnesses. We also know that there are, um, there's, there's microbes in the gut that are responsible for producing neurotransmitters um, or precursors basically for for things like dopamine and serotonin, which are obviously very heavily implicated in uh, depression. These are the things that are that are often targeted by medications. So that's the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors are one of the most common antidepressants that are used. So you know, the, I was really surprised a, a while ago to to learn that these these uh, things are, are um, you know, these hormones effectively, these chemicals are, are are often made in the gut, which was which is really bizarre to think. It seems so far from the brain. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. um, so as I say, there's still there's still more to be done. We don't really know whether it, you know which direction this goes in. It's clearly that there's some sort of link here, but we just don't know whether one causes the other but things like those mice studies which again we have to heavily you know lace with with mm-hmm. warnings that these are mice studies mice. humans are not mice <laughs> humans aren't mice um but the fact that yeah. you know introducing 
these uh, uh, these microbes into the guts of mice, you know, can lead to them having these these symptoms without having the high fat diet, which seems like a rip off to me. If you're going to have the symptoms, <laughs> at least get. You know what I mean? Am I alone with that? That it seems unfair. you might might as well get the the junk food as well. Yeah, I, I'm thinking that it was like I'm sort of thinking it's like those dogs that were deprived sleep and then had you know mm. uh, 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 fluid sucked out of their spines. It just sounds like a really bad day for your average dog. It just sounds unfair. Well, look on the other side of it. It could mean that if this uh, bacteria is responsible for depression and things. Uh, a cure for depression might be a fecal transplant. Well, is that the bright side? <laughs> Sorry, did you say that was the bright side? I don't know, maybe it is. I'm, maybe well, I'm judging I mean, a fecal transplant too hard. No, would you rather be a tired dog having fluid sucked out or would you rather get a fecal transplant? I, I, I don't, don't know. know. I don't I'm know the answer that up to that question. You know, funnily enough... I don't think fecal, it's really an and or equation, to be honest. <laughs> fecal, strangely enough, and this, this, this is not a normal thing, but strangely enough, fecal transplants came up over dinner conversation tonight in my household with my kids, and it was nothing to do with this story, which is just bizarre. It's really not something that should be mentioned at dinner, I think. <laughs> I can't even remember the context now, but, yeah, my oldest son was telling my younger son about it, who was horrified. <laughs> <laughs> Well, another option might be just probiotics or something. But as oh, you sure. say, we still need to determine whether it's a cause or an, an effect, as in are these bacteria right. causing the depression or is the depression causing a dietary change that might cause the uh, bacterial change? Well, that's right. And when it comes to things like probiotics, for example, or indeed antibiotics, you, you they, again, like we're talking before about the insecticides, they can be a blunt sort of instrument. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can mm -hmm. end up whacking the whole microbiome of the gut. So, you know, as, as much as we joke about it, things like fecal transplant are actually used for this to try and take, okay, we want to encourage the development of this particular flora in your gut and it's missing there right now. So that's one way to get it there, as, as gross as it sounds. And that's a great note to end the show. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but Cameron, I think you must agree. Mosquitoes sound a lot more easy to deal with than humans. Yes, I, I would. <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to limit myself to just one species, anyway. Yeah, fair point. <laughs> well, that's our show. And as always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com/three two three. Don't forget to check out scienceontop.com/donate to become a Patreon. Uh, for this week and the next four, we're giving all our donations to Penelope Green's favourite charities. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Cameron Webb. No, it's a pleasure. Uh, thanks, Ed. Thanks, Lucas. Thanks, Penny. Thank you, Cameron. It was great to hear all about, yeah, everything. Thanks, Cameron. Is there anything you'd like to plug or where can people find you on the internet? If uh, if people want to kind of hang out on Twitter, you can find me at Mozzybytes. Um, uh, similarly, uh, Mozzybytes uh, on Facebook. And um, if you if you sort of Google um, or use your favourite search engine to search for Cameron Webb and mosquitoes, I'm sure that I will be very easy to find. And we'll have those links, of course, in the show notes. Thank you. And as always, thanks for joining me, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Um, I speak a little bit to, to John's statement about the legacy of this rover. Uh, when Opportunity landed back in 2004, I was actually in high school. Um, I was a high school junior, but I had the amazing opportunity to come to JPL and actually be here when the rovers landed. I was a participant in an outreach program sponsored by the Planetary Society. And it was those first images from Opportunity that inspired me to become a planetary scientist. Uh, they revealed a, a view of Mars that we had never seen before. And I was in the room with the folks who were so excited to see that bedrock in that crater. And I wanted to know why. Um, you know, I, I've been hearing a lot of people's stories, both from within the project, from within JPL, and from all over the world via social media. And what strikes me as so cool is that this story is not unique for me. There really are hundreds, if not thousands, of students who are just like me, who witnessed these rovers and followed along their mission from the images they released to the public over the last 15 years, and because of that, went to pursue careers in science and education and math.